Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm not sure how many of the persons opening questions I'm going to address. If I <laughs> in, in, certainly in 15 minutes, <laughs> yeah, if, if, if I don't get do more than one or two, my excuses. I think I came from the other half of the session, which was <laughs> organising. But there will be a connection actually between what I'm talking about and what Kirsten's just been talking about, uh, uh, particularly around fair data. What I'm going to try and, and cover, particularly in the, in the context of a session on research data data and digital corpora is the right way of, of doing it. In 20 years of archiving digital data, we've had a lot of experience of digital corpora that have completely disappeared because they've not been set up with regard to the FAIR principles. And the take home message, if, if there is one from this presentation, which is mainly about updating you with a bit of information on uh, research infrastructures, is the importance of developing digital corpora in the context of some form of infrastructure so that it, they are sustainable, because otherwise they will just disappear and we have seen too many websites uh, come and go. Uh, so that's the take-home message. I'm going to say a little bit of, uh, more about FAIR data and then talk about a number of European initiatives in research infrastructures that are ongoing, uh, because you may be aware that the, the Commission is putting a lot of, of investment uh, largely in sciences, but also in social sciences and humanities. And there are opportunities for archaeology here that we need to be part of, we need to inform them, uh, and we need to, uh, to engage with them. So the, the FAIR principles, if there are people in, these, in the room that don't know what they are, Kirsten mentioned them, but findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and that breaks down really to them being easy to find, that data should be easy to find by both humans and computers, accessible and the important, the key word here for me is, is if you get long term, uh, not just that they're accessible now but will be accessible into the, the future and you know the terms and conditions that, that you can use them under, um, that they need to be interoperable, it's no good to have, just have lots of data silos, you need to be able to search across data sets this is very well exemplified by the, the NEMISMA uh, initiative. And they also need to be a format in the format that they can be re reusable for future research. That is the ideal. Now, what is most archaeological data like? Now, I owe this to Isto Huvila, <laughs> who, 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 who gave a paper at the CDH conference in Leiden in 2017, uh, entitled, Being Fair When Archaeological Information is Mean. So he thought that most archaeological data is miscellaneous, exceptional, arbitrary, and non-conformist. So we've got some way to go. I think Isto is right. We've got some way to go uh, to make our data fair. But there is a lot of help available to do that. Fair can... There is a risk that fair is just a platitude um, and uh, that everyone now cites... Oh, well, our data will be fair in their research grant application to, to tick the box. There is much more to it to, than, than just a box ticking exercise. And we need to think particularly about the impact of the FAIR principles upon archaeological data and what it implies for our own uh, uh, discipline. There are, some, there are some useful guidelines coming out in the, in the sector. I will particularly highlight these guide, guidelines from the Parthenus uh, project, which is, I think, largely the work of, of DONS, the, uh, the, the Netherlands uh, Data Archive, on guidelines to verify your data management. I'm not going to go into them. They're, they, they're downloadable from the web. They're being translated into multiple uh, languages. You can find them on the Parthenus website. But they went through 20 guidelines, you say, to verify data management and make data reusable, particularly from a, a, a heritage uh, perspective. FAIR is being quoted by large numbers of European initiatives on, in uh, heritage and much more broadly. Uh, the most relevant one to heritage that I'll say a bit more, of, uh, more about is, is Ariadne uh, Plus, the follow-on from, from Ariadne, and a quick uh, plug for a book published, in fact, yesterday <laughs> on the Ariadne impact. It's available... Uh, there's a specimen copy on the Archaeological Bookstore on floor five, but it will be available as an open access monograph uh, online in probably about a month's uh, uh, time, uh, downloadable from the, uh, the Ariadne uh, uh, website. 
And a lot of the papers in that book provided by a variety of, of heritage partners are about the FAIR principles and their application in their own areas. But Ariane Plus sits within a larger framework of infrastructures. Uh, ERIS uh, 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 is in the preparatory phase of being uh, set up as a, as a uh, European research infrastructure, part of the ESRI framework, specifically for heritage science. And then that sits within, there's this hierarchies upon hierarchies within these things, but it sits within a uh, uh, thing called SHOCK, which is the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, which brings together a lot of the larger infrastructures such as Daria, you may have come across uh, for, uh, for the Arts and Humanities, at CESDA, at Social Sciences Clarion, for the Linguistics. These are all data infrastructures bringing together data across Europe and beyond. And SHOCK, in turn, is working closely with this thing, EOS, the European Open Science Cloud. So archaeology is just a small area in that, but we can uh, influence it, we can contribute to it, we're a, we're a community within that. I'll say a bit more, if I have time, about each of these. Uh, so uh, ERIS is based on the, the concept of four types of, of laboratories, what it calls, uh, which are the areas that need to support heritage science research. So the, the large-scale permanent facilities like the radiocarbon dating labs, Fix Lab, there's uh, MoLab for mobile laboratories which travel around the, the country and can bring instrumentation to you. Then there are, there's Art Lab, which are the sort of scientific archives, uh, including reference collections. And then DigiLab, uh, which is where Ariane Plus and other initiatives come in, which is a, a virtual laboratory. It's largely bringing data sets uh, uh, together, but there is a sort of fixed element of that with high performance computing as, uh, as well. So DigiLab is about digital data and tools, it's about virtual access to scientific data, particularly concerning the tangible uh, heritage. ADS has a, a particular role within ERIS in looking at two areas. Um, and unfortunately, you can't escape things like financial aspects of, of data management. As I, uh, we say there under the definition of this particular task, heritage data are potentially very large, they're collected in a wide variety of formats, they're often born digital. Um, they are valued for, for future research, they need to be uh, preserved, but that can lead to significant long-term costs. And that's often not considered. So one of the things that we are doing as part of that work package is writing recommendations, reviewing the different cost models that exist for digital archiving. And that's um, uh, something that's been taken up. I said I wouldn't have time to mention this in the presentation, but I can mention the CIADA cost action, which we're also involved in, which is saving European archaeology from a digital data dark age. And, and there we're also looking at this issue of how do you set up a digital archive and how do you look at the, 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 the cost uh, costs of that. Uh, but then we're also looking at particularly aspects of data curation for the heritage science area, data quality assurance, the life cycle, data management and preservation, particularly looking at the, the quite special and unique types of data produced in heritage science. Um, so moving rapidly on to, to shock, as, the, as its subtitle suggests, this is particularly looking at how the social sciences of humanities fit into the European Open Science Cloud. Um, and uh, ADS is, is, is in there representing really Ariadne Plus, but representing more broadly the archaeological uh, research community as one uh, quite well-developed research community in its use of digital uh, data. Uh, and so we're informing the development of, of shock policies in terms of well, what are the user needs of the archaeological uh, community. And there are other groups that uh, involved, uh, as you, you might be able to see some of the logos there, but another group, for example, from the National Gallery in the UK are representing another sort of heritage-related um, user community. But shock also makes extensive reference to these FAIR principles which cover the whole uh, data life cycle from the, the initial concept and, and collection through the processing, distribution, discovery and then analysis and, and there should really be a, a circle going, going around there, back to the beginning. Um, and 
Shock, as I mentioned, sits within this broader European concept of the European Open Science Cloud and brings together uh, these e-infrastructures uh, in what well, it has this concept of a marketplace, putting users in touch with uh, services, putting them in touch with tools that they can use to analyse their data, uh, making them aware of training courses uh, that are available uh, to help them reuse data. And I scattered a few flyers on the, the table about opportunities for training courses within Ariadne Plus and transnational access. So there are flyers about that. These are available to apply for and you don't have to pay to go on them, even, even better. Uh, you receive money to go on them. So look out for the, the calls just being announced. So that sort of fits in within this uh, broader marketplace of, of, of opportunities here. Uh, and again, with our role particularly in there is again focused on the sort of heritage science uh, area and some of the specific accessibility and interoperability issues there and trying to think about the, the, the differences that exist in different parts of Europe as well and beyond in terms of the difficulties of making data fair. And I mentioned there some examples about the difference in the legal protection systems. We're going to be talking later in papers about uh, access to uh, publicly collected data, about metal detected data, which of course is a really uh, interesting issue in Europe. In some countries it's illegal, in others it's a major uh, source of research data. Uh, so it's how we reconcile those in the context of a European uh, infrastructure is, is quite challenging. So we're, those are the sorts of issues that we're, we're thinking about there. Uh, so last but not least, a uh, uh, plug for Ariadne Plus, which has just uh, kicked off this year, uh, where we are trying to uh, provide a lead for the archaeological partners and uh, bridging the link between the archaeologists and the information scientists. Uh, Ariadne Plus, if you're familiar with Ariadne, that um, had partial European coverage. We're trying to extend to cover most of Europe now and also to cover, we're going to be hearing from our Argentinian partners at the end of this uh, session. We're now going to cover Argentina, Japan and the, uh, the United States to make those international uh, links there. But we're also extending thematically um, in terms of chronological coverage uh, but also in different areas of archaeology that are being covered, particularly in the science area, bioarchaeology, environmental archaeology, uh, and uh, archaeometallurgy, dating, etc., etc. Uh, and we've set up a number, number of special interest groups uh, that I've mentioned there very briefly. I think this presentation is being recorded, so you can review there the partners that are leading those and it's an opportunity then to get involved and to participate in some of those uh, task groups if you've got interest in making data fair in, in, in those uh, areas, working through those, uh, those subtasks. Uh, so Ariadne, plus there's a number of particular things that we're doing with regard to fair data, we can go from practice, yeah, in archaeological data management. We're gonna be providing over the next four years a number of policy support tools specifically focused on the archaeological community, a, a data management plan a template and a protocol for our domain, a policy wizard, which according to which country you're working in, it will guide you to the policies that are online, whether they're ADS for the UK and, or England, uh, some aspects of that, or whether they're the Swedish national policies or the, or the Netherlands ones and so forth. And then a, what we're calling a standardization wizard for documenting, documenting major uh, standards in the archaeological domain and the various authority files and the SORA and so forth. Uh, we're also going to be providing guidelines on creating repositories for those countries that are trying to uh, develop them, and how they manage those, how you do quality control, how you get uh, the core trust seal, for example, which is the sort of kite mark uh, that uh, digital repositories aspire to, and how you manage your, uh, the, your fair data, thinking about issues of IPR providing that uh, training. Thank you for uh, listening. <laughs>